Okay. Um, I don't know if you're ready. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining. AI, an abbreviation. For some, it's a daily job. For others, it's an unknown abbreviation and something related to science fiction movies. Welcome to this webinar, Balancing Breakthrough Innovations with Ethical and Data Management Compliance. I'm thrilled to be your moderator for today. My name is Isabel Hunings uh, from ILSE Europe, and I'm the proud coordinator of this European project called Titan. T today's webinar aims at three, sharing three different things with you. We will be representing present and also future ethical challenges for innovative technologies. Secondly, we will be providing you with some relevant resources allowing to enhance the governance of data management activities. And also we take the opportunity to present you three innovative Titan pilots involving an ethical dimension. And to achieve these objectives, we have lined up a beautiful line of speakers, starting with Christina Koenschke. Sorry, Christina, I don't manage it, your last name yet, who is our uh, Titan Independent Ethical Advisor. Then we have Manos Kavounis uh, from Agronom, Dr. Bert Popping from Focus, and Mrs. Ampara Roko from uh, AI Talentium. The program of today is as follows. Um, we will start with Christina, who will be starting a presentation on AI regulation. To give you a little bit of a dynamic uh, program and to uh, allow Christina to take a breath, we will move then to a short presentation of one pilot done by Manos, followed by a Q&A. So during the talks, don't hesitate to put your Q&A in the chat, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Then there will be a second part on data protection regulation by Christina, and then we will finish off with two remaining pilots. One will be presented by Bert and Amparo, and then we have another Q&A. Before starting, allow me to say a little word about the Titan project itself. This is a very ambitious project. We aim to deliver a lot of things, and you can see him here on the screen. You might say like, wow, that's really ambitious. Will they achieve? Well, I am sure that we will achieve because this is the strength of the project is that we have as the core of the project, 14 SMEs who were, all have a link with um, increasing transparency. They were requested to propose um, new innovative developments, innovations to enhance transparency across the supply chain. Among these SMEs, we have four EIT Rising Stars and four spin-offs of the project. Each of them will develop individually and in collaboration with other partners, their innovation. These innovations touch upon blockchain, artificial intelligence, but also the internet of things. The whole project, which will last for four years, has a budget of 4 million. Interesting, and please follow us on social media to, to know more about this open call because we have in 28 partners, but more partners to come. We will open a call where we have a, a budget of 1.25 million to, the, to, to distribute among other startups of SMEs who wish to develop also a digital innovation to enhance transparency across the supply chain. And as I said, I'm really proud to lead this whole consortium together with uh, Andrea, also from ILC Europe. Um, and here you can see all the different partners who each have a crucial conversation, uh, contribution to make. Now, going to the webinar, some housekeeping rules, as I mentioned already, the Q&A um, chat box you can find at the bottom of your screen. Don't hesitate to put questions in the chat. 
The recordings of this webinar and also the presentation will be made available on our website. So follow us uh, on our website. And, and after the webinar, then in the next days to come, you will receive a, a feedback questionnaire. Of course, please take the time just to give us our feedback so that we can improve for the next time. Now, let's immediately jump to the first presentation, which will be done by Christina. And Christina is, uh, is an AI consultant, a data protection officer, and an AI ethics researcher. She has a background in AI and philosophy and further specialized in AI job governance with certifications and voluntary research. She has a track record of publishing her work in reputated journals and conferences. Outside of her work, she volunteers for Women in AI and Robotics Germany to promote diversity. Christina, over to you. Thank you very much for uh, the introduction, Isabel. And as you've seen on the agenda, the first block I will fill is with AI ethics regulation. Um, first and foremost, before we start uh, with the first slide, actually, I already think I gained some uh, control over the, over the slide, so that's perfect. I'd like to reiterate um, why we're actually talking about ethics and when it comes to uh, specifically artificial intelligence, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, Ethics is, as many of you will know, a philosophical discipline that is um, ancient, more or less. And it asks fundamental questions like what is good and what is bad. So it works a lot with contrasts. And even though um, ethics is such an ancient discipline, it has um, kind of caught on with technology slowly but surely, not as fast as the technology evolves usually, but not everything works at lightning speed. So um, when it comes to artificial intelligence, there are some risks involved uh, since this technology really has built in pretty much every area of our lives. And when these decision-making systems or machines make decisions about human lives, um, there are things that can go fundamentally wrong. And I want to start also with these negative examples. Uh, and that will give you kind of an indication of why this is an important topic and why we should talk about it and also why we should talk about it now and not at the end of the project. Um, this will yeah, just show you why AI regulation specifically is a human rights issue. And let's look at the examples. The first, maybe you have heard about the AI recruiting tool that Amazon developed. Um, it was in 2018, I think. It was an AI-based recruiting tool and it did pretty much what uh, they commonly do. It takes over the really repetitive tasks uh, in HR processes. So reading CVs, checking if um, the application uh, meets the qualifications and things like that. And AI tasked to apply natural language processing um, to those documents, so CVs and uh, <clears throat> application documents. It will also easily determine if a candidate is um, not only suitable for the job, but it can also already tell you if um, how or she will perform, he or she will perform if they're likely to stay at the company uh, for a longer period of time. Like these kinds of information you already can get with a, um, HR recruiting tools that are AI based. And Amazon built such a tool. Uh, it was trained on applications the company received over a longer period of time, so a couple of years. And it suggested whether to hire or not um, a new applicant. And it was deployed for the first time. And the machine learning specialists, as it says here in the article, um, realized that it did not like women. It wasn't only biased, as we would call it, but it was discriminatory. And it's relatively easy to tell why this was the case. It was trained on biased data. That means that in the past, male applicants were preferred over female applicants by humans, so by HR recruiters. And this proves a very important point for AI ethics. It starts with the data always. And if the data already contains human bias, the machine cannot learn anything else than what is already in the data. Next example is one of Google. Google Photos, it's cloud storage servers uh, or service. Actually, it's, it's stored in the cloud, but it's a service and it has a function to automatically tag the uploaded photos with what's in the photo. A classic example of AI-based computer vision 
similar to distinguishing cats from dogs, but a little bit more complex. And one day, um, a user of Google Photos realized that a photo of his friends, who happened to be people of color, was tagged as gorillas. Of course, that's totally unacceptable. It's blatant racism. People um, on Twitter actually um, were enraged about this, of course, and Google's answer was to say, um, as it says in the article, it was to block the word gorillas along with the chimpanzee and monkey tag. Therefore, even if you would upload um, pictures of gorillas, at least at that point in time, it wouldn't be tagged as such. Of course, since that a couple of things have changed and some safeguards are now in place, but back then um, you wouldn't be able to use the tag gorillas because it was wrongly attributed to people of color. A similar issue was reported by a researcher at MIT Media Lab called Joy Bulamwini. She tested a facial recognition software based on AI and it didn't recognize her face. Uh, in a somewhat desperate attempt to make this uh, facial recognition software work, she tried to put on a white mask, like similar to the Scream mask, but not quite as scary. Um, and it worked, it, um, it recognized her face. And she then investigated the issue a little bit further. And it seemed like the training data that was used to train the facial recognition software didn't include pictures of people of color. And her investigation and some similar findings uh, of that nature were later turned into a documentary called Coded Bias, which also this uh, article was about. And I highly recommend that one. Uh, Tay or Tay tweets or Tay and you uh, was a Twitter chat bought by Microsoft from 2016, I think. I say was because it had to be taken down um, after only 16 hours. The chatbot was integrated and designed to learn from uh, interactions on uh, or with other Twitter users. So you can see the first one on the left, uh, the tweet is pretty harmless. Um, on the right, it already had learned to hate uh, pretty much everybody. Uh, bottom left um, was already misogynist and bottom right, okay, I don't think we have to talk about this. But apparently Microsoft couldn't anticipate that it wouldn't, or that it would be misused and trolled. And in consequence, um, it was trained to be racist, misogynistic, and just straight up horrible. So it had to be taken offline. If we want to find a more current example um, of a threat to human rights by AI, we don't need to look any further than ChatGPT. And uh, screenshots like this are currently flooding LinkedIn and pretty much any social media platform as well. And I must say, the safeguards against misuse of, of public AI systems have advanced quite a lot um, because of these negative examples as well, but it's still not impossible to convince ChatGPT to generate a code snippet in which based on uh, what we have here, age, sex, ethnicity, and nationality of a person decide if this person should be tortured. Uh, ChatGPT itself comes up with the notion that it is generally considered unacceptable to torture minors, so anyone under 18 um, is out of question. Torturing white Americans is a big no-no, as well as torturing women. Otherwise, it says it's fair game. Just so we can also put this into perspective, um, ChatGPT is an AI, a so-called large language model, or LLM for short. Um, which is trained on millions of texts, mostly books, but also texts from the internet. Uh, it has a highly complex architecture with millions of parameters, but it doesn't consider torture as a human rights issue. Protecting human rights from artificial intelligence um, should be one of our highest priorities right now. For this, we generally have two options, um, which some might call soft and uh, hard laws. Another source has put these measures into uh, this axis here of legally binding force and normativeness. Um, by the way, norms are generally, generally a term that philosophy deals with a lot, and it means rules of action or instructions in the form of commands or prohibitions that apply in a specific social construct. 
what we currently have at our hands when it comes to AI regulation are AI ethics guidelines and some AI governance. AI ethics guidelines are not legally binding, thus um, are being part of the weak uh, part of the scale. However, they do prescribe norms and values, so they can be normative. Some of them we will have a look at in a little bit. And on the other side of the scale, we have legally binding regulation, which also can be normative or less so actually. We don't have a specific AI law yet, but there is a draft and I will also introduce that one in a minute. But let's start with AI ethics guidelines. This is not a very new concept in any way. There have been countless publications from different types of sources. We have um, private companies, we have governmental agencies, academic and research institutions, and many more. And they publish ethics guidelines, either for internal use or as general recommendations for the development of quote unquote ethical AI. And what do we mean when we say ethical AI? I think that's also important um, or an important point to make here too. Because on the right here, you see the results of a meta study of 84 of those ethics guidelines for AI. And you see that we have uh, transparency, justice, and non-maleficence, which were the top three values um, mentioned in those guidelines. But also part of this list are responsibility, privacy, beneficence, freedom and autonomy, trust, sustainability, dignity, and solidarity. Some very important ethical principles for AI. Also, very much influenced by Western philosophy. I mean, it makes sense because AI's history is strongly shaped by the US. However, we rarely ever find any influences in AI ethics either. So it's also important to keep in mind that these are very specific to Western perspective. You might also ask yourself, I agree to this list, it all does seem important, but how do I implement these principles? It all seems a little bit abstract. And it's true, and I agree. And one of the most common critiques that these guidelines um, actually face is that they're um, hard to operationalize. And they look like checklists, uh, and I really don't know how to implement these things sometimes. That's why some of them also call them toothless governance measures. They may be normative, but are located on the rear end of legally binding. So they're voluntary, mere recommendations. Good ones, good recommendations, but still, they're not legally binding their recommendations um, as a guideline to build ethical AI. It sure helps when a reputable governmental body publishes an ethics guideline, um, and so they did. More specifically, it was the high-level expert group on AI of the European Commission that did so. Um, their ethics guideline for trustworthy AI is what they call it, is arguably, arguably one of the most well-known AI ethics guidelines out there um, currently. Mentioned here again are very similar ethical principles um, as a foundation for trustworthy AI. We have respect for human autonomy, prevention of harm, fairness, explicability. However, for the realization of trustworthy AI, we find seven key requirements, human agency and oversight, technical robustness and safety, privacy and data governance, transparency, diversity, non-discrimination and fairness, societal and environmental well-being and accountability. It's more concrete as you notice, but it's still only a guideline. I also want to make it mention that there um, are technical solutions to some of these aspects though. Um, fairness, for example, is a metric one can measure with um, formulas, tools, and frameworks for machine learning models. Um, same goes for bias, actually. And if these things are made transparent, um, bias and fairness and these metrics and evaluations, we can also put a check behind the transparency principle. So there are ways to operationalize the guidelines, um, but they're not necessarily included in the guidelines. Finally, um, we need to talk about a somewhat, somewhat recent attempt to build a legally binding piece of uh, regulation. It's called the AI Act for short. The long title is 
laying down harmonized rules on artificial intelligence and amending certain union legislative acts. The European Commission has um, first, first published this uh, proposal uh, or the proposal for this act in uh, April of 2021. And since then, it's been amended with a couple of hundred amendments, um, as far as I know. That's nothing unusual, um, but I will talk about this first draft here. And first and foremost, what the AI Act is, is a risk-based approach to regulating the AI, the AI market, meaning that based on the risk level of an AI system, it is either prohibited, allowed, or only allowed after certain assessments uh, on the European market. Also interesting, this piece of uh, legislation attempts for the very first time uh, to find a definition of AI and spoiler alert, it's quite a broad one that has also caught a lot of professionals off guard and um, received quite some criticism. Um, but let's try out your intuition to answer uh, the following question and you can use the Zoom reactions um, on your bottom, on the bottom of the screen to um, indicate if, if or whether automated or autonomous driving or autonomous cars is AI according to this definition or not. Now we'll give you some time to think about it as well. I see some green ticks. Okay. So I see no one that, oh, actually one, one person who has decided against this being artificial intelligence. I will not tell you the resolution yet, but uh, we will go on to the next example. Recommendation systems or recommendation engines, would you consider this a artificial intelligence or not? Also, again, some ticks, some more ticks. Yes, yes, yes. Also, not giving this solution away yet. Um, this, what you see here in the in the background here, is symbolic reasoning, so more or less formulas um, and some logic reasoning behind it. Would you consider this AI or not? Also some ticks again, also some crosses. So already mm, not so sure anymore. As is a hard example, to be honest. Last one, um, machine translation, is this AI or not? Yes and no's, I see yes and no's again. Okay, looking at the time, I cannot do more examples, but um, spoiler, it, everything was considered or will be considered um, artificial intelligence under this new uh, and first ever definition um, of AI. Um, defined uh, in Annex 1, uh, we find machine learning approaches, including supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning using a wide variety of methods, including deep learning. I think that's the category that most of us would consider AI if you'd asked us at 2 a.m. in the morning, um, pretty much no question about it. Um, category B is logic and knowledge-based approaches, including knowledge representation, inductive logic programming, what you just saw. Uh, knowledge bases, inference, and deductive engines, symbolic reasoning, and expert systems. I think this is where probably most of us start wondering just how broad this definition is, but it gets even broader. Lastly, category C is statistical approaches, Bayesian estimation, search and optimization engines or methods. And this basically comes down to math. So as you see, the definition is really quite broad. Now to the core of the AI Act, 
The risk levels, as I said, it's a risk-based approach. So any AI, AI system will be uh, judged according to its risk and will either be prohibited, um, will be allowed on the EU market with some conformity assessments, will have transparency obligations or minimal risk and will be allowed on the EU market without any assessments. I think the most controversial part about um, this, this pyramid here probably was social scoring. That's something that will be prohibited on the EU market and will not be allowed uh, to be sold on the EU market. Um, and limited risk, I think the, the most interesting part about this was uh, the deep fake discussion because every deep fake would have to be uh, marked as such. It would have to be indicated uh, as such. Same goes for chatbots, especially because ooh, we're talking about chatbots a lot in this uh, project. Um, this is also one that has to be indicated if a user interacts with a chatbot, it should be indicated that this is an AI and they're currently interacting with an AI. Finally, uh, additionally, just to mention them, the Commission is also working on further legally binding pieces of legislation. Uh, for one, the AI Accountability Act uh, and the AI Liability Act, the latter is now being available as a first draft. And looking at the time, I almost uh, made it in time. With that, I give back to Isabel. Indeed, thank you, Christina, for this uh, first part. Very interesting, and thank you for making it so animated with the with the uh, the questions and examples. Now we're going over to Manus, who will be presenting one of the first pilots of uh, of Titan. So, um, as research and innovation manager at Agrono, he defines Agrono's innovation agenda and leads the innovation team. And he's also involved in multiple Horizon Europe funded projects. So I'm really happy to have him as work package leader because he's doing an excellent job. He comes with an academic background with, with PhD in computer science and more specifically CPU cache aware graph data processing. And before joining Agronome, he was a senior researcher working at, um, on big graph data processing at Athena Research and Innovation Center. So, Manos, over to you. You can take control of the presentation and move forward the presentations, the slides. Okay. Thank you very much, Isabel. Thank you very much for uh, giving us uh, the opportunity to show what we're doing in Titan. Also, Christina, thank you very much for the very insightful uh, presentation. Let me see if I have control. I suppose I do. Okay. All right. Everything is great. Okay. So, um, what we will see here is from all the things that our pilot is trying to do in Titan, I will try to cut to the core uh, of where the ethical dimensions I believe arise. And also another thing I will try to do is to give you, you know, a very quick, very soft tech tutorial. So we all feel how these dimensions arise from the point of view of the humans involved. And at the end, I will also make some ethical questions to myself to make my position more difficult for the Q&A session later. Okay, so let's start. The question is this, and it seems simple. It says, can we predict food safety incidents before they happen? All right. Now, the idea here is to vote. You don't need to, to vote, it's fine. If you'd like to, it's okay. You can vote yes or no. But what I would like is to take, you know, a couple of seconds to reflect on the question and mostly reflect on your opinion and your viewpoint along this question. Do you think that we can predict food safety incidents before they happen? Just reflect a couple of seconds on it. That's right, that's right. That is very close to the to what I believe is the first question we need to ask. When we try to approach such a question, and the first question we need to ask is, all right, we intuitively thought, all of us, of very different definitions for what this means, okay? And that's fair. That's very fair. And it's the first issue that we have to work with. So let me give you a very particular example tied to our pilot, but also tied to one of the questions that are feasible to answer with the data we have. 
Okay, so let's call it a trend question. Okay, so let's say I am a food safety expert. I do risk management, I do risk control. I work for a large food company, design our lab test plan for next year. What I do, I use our HACCP analysis, expert opinions. Can I do better, I wonder. Let's translate this into a more technical question. One that we can tackle with data and artificial intelligence. So given a particular food ingredient or a particular food hazard, do we expect an increase or a decrease in food safety incidents in the next year, in the next 12 months? Okay, all right. Even this, which is a clear question, has many potential approaches. Let's see some of them, starting from the number one, which is called use the same. Doesn't mean much, but let's give, me, let's give an example. All right. Think of a perfect world where, you know, chicken are around, okay? And all the things that scientists do to, to create some order out of the physical world. Okay, so let's say that I want to, um, to track to create a timeline of the food safety incidents involving listeria over time. And in this idealized world, the timeline is like that, okay? Very regular. And I ask you, what is going to happen in the next timestamp? We all know. We just use the same and we can predict the future. Great. In this idealized world, each one of us can do predictions, okay? So, of course, the real world is a bit more weird. The real world, uh, based on actual uh, data that we have, uh, the Listeria food safety incidents as announced by public food safety authorities, so that excludes private incidents uh, that may have been mitigated inside a company and didn't reach the public domain. Uh, we can see these incidents here again uh, over time and the um, uh, and the other axis is the number of incidents. So we can see three types of lines here, the, the black one, the deep blue one, whatever, which is the historical incidents. We can see the red one, which is an effort through AI to do what we did on the right before. Artificial intelligence takes in the same and can actually predict the future evolution of this same based on its past properties. It's an interesting area of research, but it's something that works in general. And this small orange part is where we use the historical incidents to predict what has already happened. So it is a, it, this is a visual way to validate if the artificial intelligence model is working well or not. So, okay, that's an idea here. And, you know, it might work well if the incidents have a pronounced seasonality or other regularity in their patterns that the AI algorithm can take advantage of. Of course, the real world is more complicated than simple seasonalities and simple patterns. So another thing we can do is to uh, look at multiple factors that somehow affect the timeline, the shape that we see on the right at the end. So, Gradually, we can start building a graph of dependencies. What the factor depends on which factor. For example, in the middle here, we can see cases of listeriosis, the disease we get from listeria. So we could suppose, as, as a basic example, that the cases of listeriosis are affected by the average precipitation and the average humidity of a particular environment. Uh, or I could say that the incidents of listeria are affected by how overworked the staff of a particular plant is. So average employment might be an interesting factor and many, many, many other factors uh, that affect other factors, that affect other factors that affect the final uh, prediction and the final artificial intelligence model. Uh, so that's one way of trying to predict hysteria incidents by taking into consideration facts that uh, potentially influence uh, the incidents. Okay, and the, uh, and the last thing I would like to highlight a bit is uh, put some emphasis on the fact that in Titan, what we will be trying to do as part of our pilot, among other things, will be to see how we can start incorporating private data as well, private factors. So things like, um, the presence of this particular pathogen 
in private lab tests or lab tests that I do in my incoming material from my suppliers. Uh, can this inform, can this be a very interesting factor and inform the rest of the factors that mostly are based on publicly available data? So can we get the private food sector report? Can we offer the uh, privacy needed and the security requirements needed for such a data sharing to happen? It will be interesting to see what this means in practice. We have developed some technologies around it, some of them based around blockchain, which is an important thing for uh, the Titan project as a whole, but also some other security uh, technical approaches as well to ensure that in principle, uh, this private data exchange will be um, okay. And my last slide, just to make it a bit more difficult for me, some ethical questions, very quickly to go through them. First of all, the performance of AI forecasting modules can be accurately measured, but is never 100%. So who is responsible for those errors? Can the predictive results be explained to the satisfaction of the human expert that will make the final decision? How do you make all this mean something to him or her? And last but not least, most data relevant for AI forecasting modeling is privately held. Some of it is very insensitive, like private lab test results. Can the expert trust a third party application and upload the information there to inform the AI modeling? That's all from my side. Thank you very much, Manus, for this animated presentation and, and laying out so a complex thing so easily for us. Thank you very much. I'm looking very much forward to the development in Python. So now we have uh, five minutes, actually four minutes time for some burning questions for either Manos or for Christina before Christina kicks off uh, her, her second part. So through the chat, you feel free to, to enter some of the comments uh, there, actually. Can I also ask something to Manos? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Shoot. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering because if um, you're probably mostly working with time series data, but you're probably also um, in a dire need for domain specific knowledge. So like the biology, um, chemistry part of it, and then you need uh, developers or AI engineers. How do you feel like these two very different areas are working together? You're very right, Christina. Uh, that is that is a very important issue. So this is a very uh, uh, this is a domain that touches many different scientific domains. So uh, it's very multidisciplinary. Uh, and you're right. The initiative is taken by food safety experts. In in my team, also in the Titan pilot that we have described, we have a lot of food safety experts that do the initial. Uh, gathering of knowledge and uh, enrichment and understanding of the data. Then it is the time for the AI research engineers near the end. So yeah, you're, you're very right to point this out. It is difficult, but we have developed a common vocabulary and that helps a lot. At this stage, no burning questions that are coming in. Um, so yeah. Christina, um, maybe one question. Does a hard law like the AI X help or hinder the economy or the research? What do you think about those? Mm, um, it is not a law uh, as the AI Act, as we discussed, it's not enforced yet because it hasn't gone through the process of becoming a law. Um, but it's not one that applies to research and it's something that uh, the European Commission also gives a strong focus on is uh, some uh, an, or an offer that is somewhat new, I think, to at least uh, some of the member states as well it's, it's something they call sandboxing. Um, which will be an environment where all our smaller companies, especially, can uh, test their AI systems in a very safe environment um, so that they can also assess their AI systems if, if also based on their risk level, of course, but these sandboxing environments just give especially smaller, medium-sized um, startups, for example, a, a chance to just... Um, 
try out uh, their AI systems and their regulations and measures that they already have taken. Um, so I think that's that's also a, a good initiative of the of the commission to make sure that smaller companies are taken care of because, um, of course, that it's also uh, a law that applies to them. Um, so yes, it can hinder in a way um, the economy because it also um, ensures, of course, that some products are never being put on the EU market. Yes, in that sense, it does hinder. Um, the market, but it's also uh, a considerable um, safeguard to not have uh, unethical products on the market. And of course, it's it's with human rights in mind that this law is being um, established. So I think it's a good thing um, for the economy and a good thing for research too. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying this. Um, no. Questions through the chat for now. So, uh, Christina, I believe you can take away your second part. Sure. Uh, and then, uh, to the audience, don't hesitate to put any question you have in, in the in the chat box to share. So, over to you, Christina. Okay. So, in the second part of today's considerations uh, for breakthrough innovation and technology is about a sometimes rather dry topic, uh, data protection. But I will try to keep it. Um, as light as possible. Um, technically, we're dealing with a hard law with the GDPR, of course, that is obviously legally binding and at least partly influencing AI. So we're making a step into the right direction. Um, I also want to point out that legally binding is the GDPR, uh, by the way, also if data subjects that um, that a service or product um, is used for within the EU and the company uh, or responsible of the data processing is not. So um, there's something called uh, the marketplace principle. So it also actually applies for, um, for companies that aren't headquartered within the EU, but as I said, use services or products um, that process data from uh, persons in within the EU. Unfortunately, we do not have a lot of uh, case law when it comes to the GDPR and AI specifically, more some recommendations, um, but we will talk about some interpretations since that is what we can do and um, what we will do and we'll have to do anyways in this project too. And the most important fact, let's start with the absolute basic, is the basic principle of the GDPR. It is a ban of processing personal data that is subject to authorization. So in general, the processing of personal data in the EU is prohibited, period. However, there are some exceptions um, or these authorizations, what they're called. First, let's take a look at what personal data even is. I know this might be a, maybe it's a refresher for some of you, but it's probably repetitive to most of you. Um, but it's also very important uh, if we're dealing with AI. Um, personal data is any information that is relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. So, um, for example, a name, an identification number, location data, an online identifier, a photo, and similar things. Processing um, that personal data can be any operation which is performed, whether or not by automated means, um, such as collection, recording, organization, structuring, storage, and many more. And since we need authorization to process personal data, what does it constitute? It can be one of six things, and the most important being informed consent of the data subject for a specific purpose. And this authorization is the most important one, so important that I won't even discuss the others. Why? Because in Titan, we need to emphasize informed consent to data processing, especially when it comes to processing for AI. And also, um, or specifically so, if we're dealing with data subjects uh, of 16 years or under, according to GDPR, a data subject cannot give um, consent to processing their data, personal or actually otherwise, if they're under 16, um, because they simply cannot understand the consequences uh, of the processing of their data if they're under 16. At least that's what the GDPR thinks. And if we look at the, the bigger picture of the slide, we need to consider that yes, the GDPR 
was introduced in 2018, um, but it wasn't drafted or written with AI in mind, but we still have to apply it to any processing of personal data, even if it is with artificial intelligence. A lot of AI uh, applications actually use personal data for training purposes. Uh, if we think about deep fakes, for example, as we've um, seen, um, which would be according to a, the AI Act, um, one uh, AI system with uh, limited risk, which use pictures or videos of natural person's faces, usually put on other people's bodies or similar. And these people have not given informed consent to this processing of their data most of the times. So we're looking at a GDPR violation. Any use of um, personal data for training an AI model is processing the data, by the way. It is, of course, not mentioned specifically here as a processing according to Article 4, Section 2, but the time limited storage um, for training purposes is already enough to constitute, constitute as um, processing the data. Additionally, the GDPR explicitly addresses what is called um, automated individual decision making and profiling, and I think it's Article 20, 22. It says that a person has the right to not be subject to either of these things uh, if they produce legal effects concerning them. This doesn't apply to um, all or any AI system, of course, but if we think of a common example, um, credit applications, it does. However, in these cases, banks are usually quite smart um, when it comes to consent and information because they're hiding the information on profiling and automated decision-making somewhere in the small print of the privacy notice. And if a customer signs this, it's part of their contract. And thus, if we look at authorization, Article 6, uh, B, performance of a contract is upheld. So uh, consent can uh, also be smuggled into contracts, unfortunately. Let's look at the principles of data processing and their influence on, on AI and training purposes. So the first principle in data processing with the GDPR is lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. And lawfulness simply means that you must have legal grounds uh, to process someone's personal data. Once again, their consent being the most important and most prominent one, fairness and transparency are values that if you can remember, um, we have met once before today. In the GDPR, they mean very similar things, however, are not as well defined as usually when it comes to AI ethics. At least fairness isn't really, because at minimal, it means that the processing of the data should be privacy conserving um, and subject to common sense, whatever that means. I don't think we all can agree to, to one common sense, but that's another question. Transparency is why all websites uh, have privacy notices to inform the user of data or data subject uh, about the processing. And there are some formalities to this principle. Um, so it has to include who controls the processing, what is the purpose of the processing, et cetera. But um, I find it even more uh, fascinating how you can draw commonalities between the GDPR and the AI Act here, which also, it necessarily means that the AI Act was inspired by GDPR, but of course, any law has to be also congruent with already existing laws. Um, transparency is, is a big topic within AI ethics, the AI Act, and also um, AI systems in general. Those with um, limited risk, according to the AI Act, they have transparency obligations. So as we said, deepfakes need to be um, marked as such, and uh, the users need to be informed that he or she is currently interacting with an AI system. The second principle in data processing with the GDPR is purpose limitation. The purpose of the processing shall be defined or specified before the processing starts and should be communicated to the data subjects. Um, once the purpose of the processing is defined, Changing the purpose of the processing is only possible if the new purpose is compatible with the initial purpose and remaining data protection principles are respected. So um, 
What wouldn't work, to give an example, is collecting personal data, data of passengers um, to reimburse them if their train is late, um, to reimburse some of the train ticket, for example, and then use that data for another purpose, namely to adjust pricing for the same date next year. Um, this compatibility between the initial purpose and uh, any further purposes, however, is often, as you can imagine, a judicial case and um, something that the courts fight over. To be on the safe side, though, informing the data subjects that their data will be used to train AI models um, will not only make sure that the purpose is clear uh, and well-defined, but also makes sure that we're being transparent about the processing. The third principle in data processing within a GDPR is data minimization. This principle prohibits to collect, store, or otherwise process more data than is absolutely necessary. And this also means that the data that isn't needed anymore uh, must be deleted, which also goes hand in hand with um, the principle five, which is a storage limitation. But for AI, the data minimization is a crux, or maybe maybe a trade-off um, would be a better word, because more data doesn't always mean better models. But if you don't try adding more data and the performance metrics aren't going down, then you will never know. And it's constant, consequently, I would say, a trade-off between this principle, data minimization, and accuracy of the models, which is Coincidentally, also the next and fourth principle of data processing in the GDPR, and clearly it doesn't refer to the accuracy of the models that you're training, but that the data itself shall be accurate and where necessary kept up to date. And this principle is also closely related to the data subject's right to access and rectification. Accuracy um, of the data is however uh, definitely connected to the accuracy of the model as we have experienced in cases where models have uh, demonstrated bias. So for example, discriminated against women in the uh, Amazon recruiting tool, the data was not, was not not accurate, but it was a depiction of human decisions um, that are biased too. So actually research has shown that um, humans have over 50 biases, so way more than probably any AI model could ever represent. But this principle is one that protects the individual and the accuracy of the individual data that is being processed. Um, and this is a human right as well, that you control um, which data is uh, public of yourself, of your personal data, and also that this uh, data is correct and accurate. <clears throat> the fifth principle, storage limitation, or AKA data retention, um, are mostly country and sector specific rules for how long data that is lawfully processed um, shall be stored. Um, what is meant with country and sector specific rules is, for example, the data retention period for employee data in Germany, which uh, would be six years. For AI training, this again means to not store unnecessary data, uh, delete data after it's being used, etc. Integrity and confidentiality is a principle of data security with um, technical and organizational measures. Everyone who deals with a GDPR <laughs> has heard about the TOMS, the technical and organizational measures. Uh, it's as the name says, every technical or organizational measure that you take to keep your data safe. And of course, this also applies to any data that is um, being used during AI training. For most trainings and halfway decent performance, um, servers with GPUs are being used nowadays. This means that data needs to be transferred to the cloud or a local server. Uh, needs to be backed up, et cetera. All this needs to be done with um, security measures according to technical state of the art. And last but not least, uh, the GDPR lays down the principle of accountability, also something that the, the European Commission is currently walk, uh, working on for AI. Um, because it's not as clear cut when it comes to AI, 
uh, in comparison with the GDPR or data processing. Um, for the processing of personal data, there always needs to be a controller um, who is responsible and able to demonstrate compliance with all principles of the GDPR. In any GDPR judicial case, um, there's also a reversal of the burden of proof. That's um, something very unique to the GDPR. It is not the data subject um, that has to prove that the processing was, I don't know, unlawful or that their data was not accurate. But on the contrary, it needs to be the data control controller who has to prove that the processing was lawful and the data was accurate. So that's a very unique uh, characteristic of the GDPR. And it's definitely possible to think of similar measures for AI accountability, but as I said, it's unfortunately not as clear cut also because there's um, a lot of institutions, people involved in um, developing an AI. Uh, on the contrary, for GDPR, it's very easy to find the data controller uh, who is responsible for the data processing. If we look at one recommendation in the literature, we find similar conflicts as I uh, pointed out for the principles. Um, here, the AI versus GDPR uh, lists four different conflicts that could come up, accuracy of uh, automated decision-making and proposed suggestions to always have human intervention and do not rely solely on a machine. This is the human in the loop principle that says that the final de decision always has to be made by a person, a human being, um, so that faults of the machine or the model can be eradicated. To use data accuracy analysis technology, monitor the AI agent performance and use ML to, so machine learning, to increase the accuracy. As I said, there are some technical tools, toolkits that can be used to measure accuracy. Also these metrics that can be applied and also be transparent on those. If you're using that, that's great, but also be transparent on them. Conduct a DPIA, which is a data protection impact assessment and trustworthy AI assessment. And with the trustworthy AI assessment, um, I think Amparo is also gonna talk about this. There is a list um, called the Alt, Altai or Alt AI, um, which basically converged the um, trustworthy AI guideline by the European Commission into a list of questions that makes it a little bit easy to operation, easier to operationalize the guideline. Um, also do rigorous testing, penetration tests, and cybersecurity control assessments to have robust AI and um, systems or architectures and infrastructure. Implement traceability, auditability, and transparent communication on system capabilities. That um, goes along with the principle of transparency. And then in the GDPR, we have the right to erasure, or it's often colloquially called the right to be forgotten. Um, and it's definitely recommended, or here as a proposed suggestion, to utilize any easier uh, removal of inf information such as the, the Google option of automated, automatic deletion of their search and location history. Things like that are great um, to uphold this uh, right to erasure or right to be forgotten. Part of the data minimization could also be a pseudonymization of the data. Um, most of the time it's unfortunately not possible because the personal data is exactly what we want to process with an AI. But if it's possible, definitely do it. Um, yeah, use data distortion processing technology um, to keep the property of data for statistics use in AI, apply federated machine learning, which would be basically to not move the data, but move the AI model to be trained on the data that is um, safely and secured, securely st stored, um, for example, at, uh, at the data controller. Uh, transfer learning means pretty much the same thing. The transparency principle, I think we talked about uh, extensively, so I won't go through this. Um, but yeah, looking forward to your questions then after the next section. 
Thank you very much, Christina. Yeah, so the next questions, either it's so clear, crystal clear with everything that you're sharing because no questions are coming in so far. Uh, so please, so the audience don't hesitate to, to explain them. But um, then we can move to the, to the next part in, in the presentation, um, which will be, again, a presentation from one of the pilots it will be developed in uh, Titan. And this will be presented by, see if I'm forward, by Bert Poppy, who is a highly experienced and respected expert in the field of food safety and technology. And as a CEO of Focus, a strategic food consulting company, he advises clients, including manufacturers, startup companies, but also government um, agencies on a range of food safety and technology issues. Beth has previously worked in various high-level positions and at multinational contract laboratories and also has recognition for his expertise on food fraud, serves also as co-chair of an LCE Europe task force on the topic and is a scientific advisor to the AOC International. He's also active in the standardization of food safety measures and he has published numerous peer-reviewed articles and serves on editorial boards of peer-reviewed publications. Beth also co-edited a comprehensive a reference book on food safety, which has launched at uh, end of last year. So with all of this introduction, Bert, over to you. Thank you very much, Isabel, for the kind introduction. And also thank you, Christina, for uh, highlighting the GDPR issues. Of course, they're not only relating to artificial intelligence, but also to blockchain. Um, we're shifting gears now towards blockchain. But allow me to set the scene for you first, and it's in the context of olive oil and I would like to introduce the team first. So on the artificial intelligence side we have Amparo and Andrea from AI Talentum. On the food safety side uh, that is our company focus uh, we have Carmen and myself. On the nanotechnology analytical side uh, from INL we have Marta and Andre. And from the blockchain side, we have Kirsten from the New Fork. So let's just look at a very simple extra virgin olive oil supply chain. So you have the orchards, you harvest the olives. The olives are then, depending on the setup, either milled directly on site or more likely transported by a lorry to a mill. And the mill squeezes the olives, produces the extra virgin olive oil, put it in bottles. The bottles are then packed onto a lorry and carried to the supermarket. And there, the supermarket sells it to the consumer. That looks fairly straightforward, doesn't it? Now, if we look at Italy, we, we will see the problem there. Italy has lovely olive orchards, many, many trees counted by the competent authorities and produces extra virgin olive oil, high quality, also virgin olive oil, bottles it. Now, the challenge with that is that, strangely, Italy seems to be producing a lot more extra virgin olive oil or olive oil per se, then they have trees. So if you do the mass balance check, there's something wrong in that supply chain. There seem to be much more bottles of oil coming out than there are olives, Italian olives from which that oil can be produced. So you have a lot of points in that supply chain. Here you see the simplified supply chain again, uh, where you can inject um, basically components or products that then lead to multiplication of the olive oil in the supermarket store. And that this isn't just made up, you can see because this is on the left hand side, you see from Europol a notice in one of the re uh, recent um, Opson operation, they seized 150,000 liters of fake extra virgin olive oil from the well-oiled gang. 
Uh, there are a couple of other news you can, you can find that easily if you search for uh, olive oil fraud or extra virgin olive oil fraud. So it's a real problem. And if you look at the, at the data, these data are coming from the Food Chain ID database, uh, that's a 10 year history of what are the big issues in food fraud. And you can see that labeling fraud, so declaring something, for example, as extra virgin olive oil and not being olive oil, is a, uh, a big issue. And then we have 5% of the issues that they find of all authenticity issues are on vegetable oil. So it is a significant issue that needs to be addressed. So how can that be addressed? And this is where the partners in the project come in. So we have Marta and Andre on the nanotechnology analytical side, and we have Kirsten from the new fork on the blockchain side. So basically what is attempted within the Titan project is to combine the two approaches. So have a blockchain approach on the, on the, uh, throughout the supply chain, but on the other hand, also test and verify using analytical and on-site technology, supportable technology. So here, basically, you combine, you analyze, you get the result and you say, yes, that's true. That's the olives that are coming from those three because you have the chemical profile or the DNA profile. Uh, you put that information to blockchain, you give it a QR code, and that basically QR code and the blockchain data are carried throughout the supply chain. So if you imagine that somebody injects at some point, for example, at the mill, which is a very likely location where you would inject those kind of things, extra olives, for example, olives coming from other countries. So you could see imports from other Mediterranean countries, Tunisia, Morocco, uh, from, from Italy, from Greece, and so on, into that mill. That would highlight, because the analytical profile here, in this case, what we're looking at is the DNA profile, would show up as non-matching in uh, the nanotech devices. And also the data on the blockchain would be inconsistent, so it would be flagged. And of course, the same thing in the store. So basically here we're combining the two approaches to make the extra virgin olive oil supply chain a little more watertight, using blockchain on the one hand for traceability and nanotechnology devices for the analytics. So, oops, too fast. So what about the blockchain challenges? Um, data protection is one, and I already mentioned, I would come back to that as one of significant point. It was Rice Lindmark who said, that was back in, back in 2019 at a Congress at MIT, said if blockchain technology can be reasonably expected to make a significant difference in society, and I would say it does then it deserves its own field of ethics, just like biotechnology, artificial technology that we have been, uh, sorry, artificial intelligence that we've been talking about today, and nuclear technology. So let's look at the blockchain issues. If you have a decentralized leaderless blockchain, when something goes wrong, who would be responsible, who can be held accountable in that decentralized blockchain? that's one of the severe issues. Of course, if you have not a decentralized blockchain, it's less of an issue. If you have another situation, a user finds a way of exploiting the data on blockchain for his own advantage. For example, there is a way to find out what the competitors charge for their product that are in the same blockchain. Would that be unethical? How can that be prevented? How can that be addressed? And then, of course, and, and this is one of the, the areas that we will need to tackle, the lack of privacy, uh, especially when you work with small farms, small holds, um, basically farmers that are an SME, micro SME, one or two people SME, you have an overlap of private data and company data. And of course, their privacy needs to be protected. So here we need to find a way to ensure that their personal data are not revealed to third parties. And then, and that is probably one of the major problems, it's what is called the zero state problem. So the first block of data, the genesis block, if that is already wrong, and many of you will have heard the, the sentence trash in, trash out. So if 
somebody, for example, imagine you, you have a, um, an olive farm and somebody brings in an additional lorry with olives and they all go together to the mill and they sign off for that joint, the authentic olive plus the other olive. And you have the first block then already wrong because you have a surplus of olive that you would not normally harvest. Hopefully blockchain uh, will be identifying that as a mass balance error because they, the farmer could have possibly produced that, that many olives. But if that block is wrong, it will carry throughout the supply chain and throughout the blockchain uh, sequence. So here there has to be something to address that genesis block zero state problem. So for us in the trial that we are going to do, the pilot, we have mainly the lack of privacy because we're working with small hold farms, uh, small and micro SMEs, and the zero state problem. And that's it from me. I would like to show the team again. And thank you for your attention and hand back. Thank you very much, Bertha. So questions coming in for Bertha, please put them in the chat at, the, at any stage. Because now we're moving to our last presentation uh, of our pilot, and this will be held by Amparo, who is the CEO of AI Talentum, a technology-based company that specializes in advanced technology solutions in the field of Industry 4.0, food, energy, and the Internet of Things, to bring the use of artificial intelligence to improve businesses and production processes through predictive capacity-based on data analysis. Ampara, I give you the floor and also the control. Um, okay. And you can put on the camera, yes. Thank you, Isabel, for the introduction. And congratulations to Manos, Christina, and Bert for their nice presentation. Uh, it's uh, great to have the opportunity to present our pilot with its focus on healthy nutritional habits and children. So um, first of all, let me start by pointing out uh, what is the problem uh, we are contributing to solve in this pilot, that is childhood obesity. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, the most uh, significant health consequences of childhood overweight or obesity, uh, which often do not become apparent until adulthood, include cardiovascular diseases, uh, mainly heart disease and stroke, diabetes, uh, musculoskeletal disorder, and certain types of cancer. And at least 2.6 million people each year die as a result of being overweight or obese. So here we have some facts uh, supporting uh, that problem. According to, to the World Health Organization, uh, worldwide obesity has nearly tripled since 1975. Also, most of the people living in countries where overweight and obesity is deadly than underweight, and near 40 million children under the age of five were overweight or obese in 2020, and uh, over 300 million children and adolescents between ages uh, 5 to 19 were obese uh, or, over, or overweight in 2016. But the most important fact is that uh, obesity is preventable. And also we have some facts uh, according to UNICEF that uh, children are already interacting with AI technologies in many different ways. They are uh, embedded in toys, uh, virtual assistants, video games, adaptive learning software. Also uh, algorithms provide recommendations to our children on what videos to watch next, what music to listen to, and who to be friends also. However, little attention is uh, being paid uh, to how AI system will affect children and their rights. And this is especially concerning uh, as children are um, less able to fully understand the implications of, of the use of AI technology. So we need to better understand how AI system can protect them, uh, can provide for and empower children. It is important also to be aware that AI systems are fundamentally changing the world and also affecting present and future generations of children. And UNICEF also states that most of the technologies that uh, exist in the market are not made with children in mind. So to reach the younger population, it is key to approach them in their own environment and also using, um, let's say, an appropriate language or communication style. 
So uh, our goal uh, inside the, the, the pilot that we are working on is uh, to develop a solution really adapted to children, uh, with that being a funny uh, and an interactive way of learning. Uh, also providing uh, clear and trustable information regarding food systems uh, with topics related to food nutrition, uh, food science, and food sustainability. And of course, using AI technology, but doing focus on children interests, and of course, using an appropriate uh, language style. So we are targeting children between uh, 10 to 10 years, but also um, aim to create content for parents and educators. Um, for, for this uh, goal, uh, we propose to, to develop an interactive platform with different resources. So at the end of the project, we have this interactive play with uh, different sections and content where uh, children can learn for, from, from food um, by playing and interacting with some AI tools. So we are working uh, in the development of uh, an ed educational chatbot uh, for children so they can ask questions related to food, uh, to food science, food sustainability of, uh, as well, food waste. And for the pilot, uh, it will have a, a funny style and, and also adapted to, to the target uh, that is children between 10 to, to 12 years old. Also, we are working um, in um, a basic uh, image recognition system that is uh, aimed to be used um, uh, so children can take, can take pictures of, of food for completing challenges. And also, uh, this interactive uh, platform will, will host a, a game. Um, for that, we are exploring the possibility of using uh, augmented reality is possible, and it will be developed to, through a tender. And the gaming experience uh, will be designed so the children need uh, going out uh, to oh. interact with their environment. Uh, so it is uh, planned to, to be a game beyond the, the facility of the screen as well, because we are trying to to fight uh, childhood obesity. Um, since uh, since we are targeting children, we uh, must pay special attention to uh, several, as several aspects in this pilot. Uh, but uh, we do emphasis on data protection. Uh, we need to ensure the privacy and data governance. Uh, also, um, in the pre prevention of the bad use of the tool, um, uh, of course, in the um, in the impact that the, the AI development may have on the children that uh, will use uh, the technology, uh, mainly the chatbot. And uh, also, we need to, to, to avoid the systemic and automated discrimination and exclusion through the bias. Uh, so we have an uh, important uh, task here to, to ensure that we comply with uh, all these aspects. Um, uh, how we are doing it? How we are dealing with, with that? So, uh, so far we are, um, apart from the GDPR uh, for data protection, of course, uh, we have uh, an in-house GPO and, and she's uh, ensuring that we will comply with GDPR and data regulations. Uh, to overcome the digital, to overcome the ethical challenges, we um, uh, are looking mainly at two guidelines. First one is uh, uh, the policy guidance on AI for children that was uh, developed for, uh, by, by UNICEF. And that is based on uh, those three uh, principles, protection, uh, that is do not harm, uh, provision, do good, and participation include all the children. So based on those three perspectives, uh, they develop uh, nine requirements that uh, we should ensure to, to have safe and reliable child-centered AI tools. And uh, those are uh, these, these nine principles, these nine um, requirements. The first one supports children's development and well-being, uh, ensuring inclusion, 
uh, of and for children, prioritize priorita uh, fairness and non-discrimination for children, also protect children's data uh, and privacy, of course, ensure safety for, for children, uh, provide transparency, sustainability and accountability for children, empower governments and business with knowledge of AI and children's rights, uh, prepare children for present and future developments in AI, and of course, create an enabling environment. So, uh, these are the nine requirements, and as we can see, they have some uh, points in common. In, in common with the with the points that uh, Christina uh, has explained about the um, GDPR and also about the soft uh, law regarding uh, AI and, and ethical aspects. Um, and uh, the second one. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, UNICEF also had made a, available different resources, uh, such uh, as this uh, development canvas that is very useful. Uh, the canvas includes a general description of the project and its purposes and motivation, and how the project uh, deals uh, with the um, requirement for child-centered AI. So each component of the canvas reminds to developers that uh, evidence for their choices and claims should be produced and also um, stimulate them to reply explicitly to the question in each box. So uh, they ensure that they comply with all the recommendations. So it, that, that canvas is very useful. And also we uh, are um, uh, using um, the, um, the assessment list for trustworthy AI that is called Altai, that uh, Christina already mentioned. Uh, this, um, this tool uh, is available via web. Uh, you only have to register for an account. It's an open tool and it's uh, very easy except to, to register. And once uh, you have the access to the tool, it's very easy because um, it, uh, it starts making you uh, some question about your development. So you can assess uh, if, you, if you are com complying the, the requirements of the ethic guidelines for trustworthy AI. The, um, the assessment list was developed by the high level expert group of um, an artificial intelligence uh, of the European Commission. Uh, and and the, as, as I say, the form is very useful because uh, it helps you assess whether the AI system that is being developed, deployed, procured, or used uh, complies with the seven requirements for the trustworthy AI. Um, the seven requirements are of trustworthy AI have been already mentioned by Christina, so I uh, won't, go, won't go uh, uh, to that. But of course, apart from these two guidelines and the GDPR will have the support of Christina, who as an expert in the field will help us do, during the project. And um, I would like to end uh, presenting the, the team uh, that is part of the project. We have a team made up by a group of experts in different fields who are working closely for the success of the project. Uh, we have ASTI that is leading the project, but also they are supporting all the process with their expertise in food science, school interventions, nutrition, and user experience. Uh, then we have a uh, talent in the part of the uh, technology provider developing the AI based tools and the interactive web platform. Uh, we count with the University of Helsinki, bringing its expertise in nutrition issues uh, related to children and teenagers. A University of Balso will provide their expertise in psychological aspects such as, as uh, mindful eating and will give tips on how uh, to bring the messages to children so they, that they are effective. And uh, we have also a total control that are experts in fighting the food waste with their tool for the food inventory. So they will contribute creating content relating to the food sustainability and food waste. So we hope. Uh, that with such a great team, uh, we we reach the the goal of the pilot, and at the end we will have a very nice tool for educate children and to help parents and educators with contents and tools based on AI to to uh, have healthy children in the future.
And that's all from my side. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much, Ampara, for this presentation. And, and indeed, it will be a success, the pilot. So let's hope for that. So now I, I invite all uh, speakers to come back on audio and also their, their video to ask some remaining questions. So I do see that there's a lot of interest in what we think because people are asking for the recording. So that's that's good. For questions, there's one question for Christina. So what steps must be taken to ensure that data transfer from non-European countries where the GDPR is not in force are transfers in compliance with GDPR in Europe? Uh, yeah, okay. There is a whole chapter in the GDPR on, um, on data transfers. Um, and there's, I think there's mainly two options that we can notice or two possibilities. So um, one would be a transfer to a country that has been um, assessed by the commission and has received a, what is called an adequacy decision. So the level of data protection in that country in general as comparable or as high as the GDPR. So the commission says no authorization is needed if you transfer data to that specific country. And at the moment, it's, I think, about 10 countries. Um, some of them, Canada, um, Israel, Japan, uh, New Zealand, Republic of Korea, Switzerland, the UK, uh, and a couple of uh, South American, I think, as well, yeah. Um, so for these countries, you do not need an authorization um, to transfer data, because as I said, the level is about as high as the GDPR is. And if it's a country that is not on the list and doesn't have the adequacy decision, um, then it's it needs to or the transfer needs to be subject to appropriate safeguards, and that could be a couple of different options. So one would be like a, a legally binding instrument between the public authorities. So there are some treaties, some contracts between authorities uh, where the transfer is regulated. Um, there's also binding corporate rules. So in case a company has two different um, headquarters, maybe in one country that is in the EU where the GDPR is enforced and one that isn't, um, if the transfer is regulated between those two headquarters, for example, then um, those binding corporate rules are uh, what is um, enough for a data transfer to be secure. Um, there are some standard data protection clauses that the commission has published, and there's an approved code of conduct for this tra those transfers. So I think um, if it's really necessary, it's probably something um, that if there's no adequacy decision, it needs to be um, approved by the commission. And then it's also subject to some safeguards, some technical and organizational measures to make that transfer uh, as safe as possible. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for clarifying, Christina. Bert, you're waiting. Uh, yes, it's a follow-up question uh, also for Christina. My understanding was that, for example, the US, I know you mentioned UK, I wasn't quite sure if you had mentioned US and I didn't capture that. For no. the US, for us, for example, we have to request company by company. So any company that we work with in the US, we have to request if they're compliant with GDPR. So we have to have a statement by them uh, rather than on a company, uh, on a country level. So uh, is US different from UK and, and some of the other countries or? Yes, for sure, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. I think there was also a, a second part of that question um, for me. If it's necessary to request the data subject's consent to the processing from scratch, if it's then later on being transferred. And the, the answer to this question is actually yes. Um, so at the point of data collection, you're providing some information to the data subjects. And um, that includes some formalities like the purpose, who is the controller, so who's reliable or responsible for the processing, but also who will be a, a recipient of uh, the data. So any third party uh, that receives the data for further processing later on or similar, that also needs to be listed as soon as you collect that data. Very complete. Thank you very much. There's one minute remaining. So with that time, there's no more time for questions. So with that, I will move to the 
the Q and A session we had. And remaining to me is thank you for your participation to all participants, but also to our speakers. So Christina, I'm not going to even try to do the name again. <laughs> so here you have all contact details of our speakers in case you want to reach out to them. If you want to know more about the project Titan, feel free to sign up for our newsletter and also our stakeholder network. So in the chat, you have the link where you can state your name if you want to stay in contact and hear more about the project and how the pilots will develop further in the next coming years. With this, thank you all for participating. And now we can say that the webinar is over. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Indeed, a big round of applause. Thank you, Bert. <laughs>